Thank you very much for the invitation to give um, this talk in this nice conference. Okay, so I have upgraded a little bit the title of the talk, which is joint with Nick Proudfoot. And the reason, because I had been giving talks with the same title, without any numbers on it, like seven years ago. And back then what we had with Nick was um, the, the construction of these um, toric analogues of spaces in non abelian Hodge theory. And we had the whole package of conjectures on their cohomology some parts of which we could prove, but basically we had no general results. So today uh, we have now theorems, so that's why it is part two. And in fact, maybe because it's a theory, you can think maybe now I can truly call it a theory because we do have theorems about these spaces. Okay, so let me first glance through the, the general, very quickly, the general ideas of non-abelian Hodge theory, and then give you um, a collection of conjectures on the cohomology of these um, varieties. And then I continue with um, talking about the toric analogues of such spaces and the analogues of those conjectures. Except, okay. So non-abelian Hodge theory in the form I'm going to represent here is going back to Carlos Simpson's uh, work in 1990, um, but it was motivated by or it was a precursor to this was Hitchin's work for Riemann surfaces. In fact, that's the only case we are going to discuss today. So the setup is this. So we start with a complex reductive algebraic group. Basically for us, it's not a big restriction always to consider GLN. And then we will look at um, non-Ebelian cohomology with these coefficients of a Riemann surface or a smooth complex projective curve. Just to get more interesting moduli spaces, we also allow some kind of decorations on the Riemann surface like punctures and parabolic structures or, um, or formal types of connections uh, at the punctures. That way we will get a much richer example, a much richer set of examples. And then to the complex curve and the, and, the, and the group G, we can associate a non-abelian Hodge cohomology groups, which makes sense at least in degree one. And then the Betty version of this cohomology is going to be uh, defined as the moduli space of representations of the fundamental group of the Riemann surface to the complex group G, modulo automorphisms. It's an affine variety. Um, and this is what we think of as the first non-abelian cohomology. You notice that we already, or I tell you that we, we are losing the linear structure on the usual abelian cohomology. Instead, we will have some non-trivial um, topology on, the, on this variety. Then the next of the, um, um, these non-abelian cohomology groups we attach to, to this um, curve and the group is the Derham cohomology on a billion Derham spaces, which is uh, defined to be the moduli space of flat G connections on the Riemann surface C. And finally, the third appearance of these non-abelian um, cohomology groups is the, is the Dobo moduli spaces, which are constructed as the moduli space of G Higgs bundles on the Riemann surface C. Okay, so we have these three non-trivial manifolds, the underlying manifolds which underlie these, um, these varieties. Uh, I am saying manifolds because in practice we always arrange the data so that we have smooth spaces. In general, this of course will not be a smooth variety, but if you introduce decorations, you can always manage to make them uh, smooth. And so in practice, I am only considering the cases when all these spaces are smooth. And in that case, in fact, in the general case, we have this celebrated non-abelian Hodge theorem, which relates these three um, non-abelian cohomology groups, like in usual Hodge theory, 
But now we have no linear structure, so the vector spaces are isomorphic, but the underlying differentiable manifolds of these three algebraic varieties are diffeomorphic. So we know that the Higgs moduli space and the flat connection moduli space is diffeomorphic. There we have even more connection between the Derham space and the Betty space by taking the monodromy of the flat connections. We have an analytical map, complex analytical map between these two algebraic varieties, and that's what we call the Riemann Hilbert map. Okay, so what I'm interested in is trying to understand the cohomology of either or then all the three spaces. And, and the interest and the exciting things come when you discover new structures on the cohomology coming from various parts of the algebraic geometry of one of the three uh, reincarnations of the same differentiable manifold. And then the game is to try to translate that structure from one uh, cohomology theory to the other and see if it makes sense and what, if it does, what, what it is. And usually you get pretty s different um, uh, structures underlying the same structure on this co cohomology of these non-abelian cohomologies. Okay, so that's our interest. And then before going to tell you what uh, kind of conjectures we have about these cohomologies, let me give you a further some geometrical inputs. Eventually we will be considering the character variety, but for now we will have two geometrical structures on, on the Deram and the Higgs moduli space, which we will be interested in. So the first geometrical structure we have on the moduli space of Higgs bundles is the, is the Hitchin map. Okay, I'm not going to define this, it's just an indication what it is. It's you take the characteristic polynomial of the Higgs field, and this turns out to be a proper integrable system. In particular, you will see the genetic fibers are abelian varieties, and you have a complicated structure of degenerations of these abelian varieties and more and more singular fibers. And then the topology of this is highly interesting and was studied and used in, of course, Engel's proof of the fundamental lemma. So it's a, it's a subtle, very interesting um, map and the topology of it is, is, um, is still not completely understood. Then, for us, what's important is that in all of the almost all of the cases, when we have decorations, sometimes we, we don't have uh, this structure, but often we will have a, um, um, a zero element in this Fi space, which is the base of the Hitchin system. And then if you have a C star action retracting um, the whole space, to the, the zero fiber, then you will have this result that the zero fiber of the Hitchin map, which we call the nilpotent cone, is going to retract or it's going to be a homotopy equivalence with the whole space. And again, because we are interested in cohomology, that's good enough. So this says that this projective variety, which will be highly singular, uh, has the same cohomology as the whole um, the Olbo moduli space and therefore the same cohomology as the other. So this as a geometrical construction will be important. And then there is also some geometrical structure we can retain from the flat connections. This really works well when the underlying curve is P1. In order to get non-trivial spaces now, you really have to in include some decorations on the Riemann surface, some punctures and with um, parabolic or or formal data attached to the, to the punctures. Anyway, I'm not going into details. We heard this actually, these constructions in Philip Stoke. He, he has been studying them for 15 years or something. So these are what he calls M star Derham spaces, the moduli space of flat connections on the trivial bundle of the, oh, in this case, it's P1 times the, um, times the group. And it turns out to be an open subvariety inside the whole M Derham space, and we will see that conjecturally it will capture some part of the cohomology of, of, these, of the three spaces we have. So, and then there is also another uh, observation of this going back to works of Philip in, in several cases that these M star Derham spaces turn out to be very simple algebraic varieties in the sense that you can define them by finite dimensional quotients, finite dimensional equations, and so these are certain Nakajima starship cover varieties. 
So fairly simple. And this will be somehow the starting point of, um, of the constructions we will have. We will replace the Nakajima killer variety with toric hyper killer varieties, which are very similarly constructed. And then we will ask to, to dream all the spaces and all the stuff around them. So that was the original motivation. OK, before going to the toric case, let me now list the conjectures we have on the uh, cohomology of these non-abelian cohomology spaces. Okay, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, of course, there is a long history, and you must have given the history, so. Right. Okay. Then, um, so what is the correction? This, we have four conjectures I'm going to discuss today. Basically, it is this extra structure which the algebraic geometry of the um, character variety induces on the cohomology of it. It's the mixed host structure on it. It's highly non-trivial and interesting. And uh, what we ask ourselves is, what can we understand about this mixed host structure and also uh, what any structure we see here might mean in the other reincarnation of the same, the same cohomology for M. Dol and M. M. Deram. So first, um, just a very basic observation or conjecture still uh, in the big generality, it's just a conjecture. We, assume, we, we think that all these cohomologies, the mixed host structure is, in one sense, is simple because it's only type uh, PP cohomology which can appear in the mixed host structure on the character variety. So that's the first conjecture, which is, in general, is still a conjecture. Then we have um, the second, which we call curious Harlefschetz property. So this variety, the character variety, is an affine variety, so it's not far, it's the opposite as being somehow projective, but somehow its cohomology, when you add the weight filtration, seems to um, satisfy an analog of the Hardlefschetz theorem uh, from projective algebraic geometry. In fact, you can identify that the, the, the correct form, which uh, actually is going to be the killer form in the Higgs moduli space complex structure, is the real part of the holomorphic symplectic form, which comes naturally on these character varieties, which is also forming part of this hyperkiller story, which I'm not going to discuss. So there is a natural holomorphic symplectic form on the character variety, take the real part, and that's going to give us a two form, which this time is not going to be the usual one one time form, as for usual hard left sheds, it's going to be a two two class, the uh, weight four class instead of a weight two class. So that's already where this curious stuff will start. And then curious hard left sheds is not going to be again that simple as ordinary hard left sheds. You have to uh, break up the cohomology according to the weights of the classes. So you take various graded pieces. Because of this conjecture, all weights are supposed to be even. So that should um, simplify the thinking. But anyway, so you take all the graded pieces of the weight filtration, and then you wedge with the um, correct uh, power of, um, of the kill, okay, let's not call it killer class, but this alpha class. And then the conjecture is that if you do it properly, you have a, a, a nice isomorphism, a nice uh, duality on cohomology, even though this is not a projective variety. Okay, then we have another conjecture which uh, will already relate to the, um, to the Deram complex structure. You remember in the Deram complex structure, in the case when the curve was P1, we had this um, open Deram space. And the conjecture says is that the pure part, the lowest part which exists on the character variety of the weight filtration, should be just a small part of the whole cohomology. This is captured by the um, cohomology, the total cohomology of the M star Deram space. So the M star Deram space is a geometrical object in this other complex structure, somehow sees the first layer of the weight filtration on the character variety. And then the fourth one will actually give a complete explanation, conjectural explanation of what the weight filtration means on the cohomology of the character variety when you change to the, the third the moduli space of Higgs bundles um, picture, and that's the conjecture we call P equals W. It says that you can construct a, 
a perverse filtration on the cohomology of the moduli space of Higgs bundles. And in fact, it is constructed uh, by the Deligne, for example, in order to make sure it has to be, the map has to be a proper map, say from a smooth variety, and you want to make sure that you have some kind of relative uh, left sheds package um, on the, because the fibers are nice projective varieties, not smooth, but the, the, the theorem says that you can cook up a perverse filtration on the total space of the vibration, which will, for example, si uh, satisfy the analog of this uh, uh, hard left sheds relative. We call this, in this case, hard left sheds theorem when you replace here W with P and M B should be M B here with M do there. So anyway, so there is some um, extra filtration on the cohomology of the moduli space Higgs bundles as well. It, ha it comes from the topology of the Hitchin system, highly non-trivial, and this again was something what Engel was studying in his proof or something related. And then the conjecture says that, in fact, this perverse filtration is nothing but the weight filtration on the character variety side. So you identify the cohomologies by the non-abelian Hodge theorem, and then you can transform, transfer the, um, the weight filtration on the character variety, cohomology of the character variety. The conjecture is that it's precisely the perverse filtration on the Higgs moduli space side. So these are the four conjectures we are going to discuss today. Uh, they are basically proved in the case of GL2 with various co-authors. Um, we have studied them with uh, <laughs> Fernando, Rodriguez, Vigegas, Emmanuel, Letelier, uh, with, uh, and then the Picos W is with De Cataldo and Migliorini. And, uh, yeah, and then we have later works in the irregular case with, um, with Mereb, Wong, and, uh, and Wyss. Okay, and then besides the GL2 case, a lot of um, whatever we could check, for example, you can consider um, the conjecture which was proved by um, Johan on the intersection form of the Higgs moduli space is a con consequence of the purity conjecture in the ASO. A, in that case, it's not genus zero, so, but you have an analog of this M star, at least the, for the cohomology of the M star theorem space, which we know is, um, which we know is, uh, has no pure, has no uh, cohomology in the middle degree, and that will imply, this conjecture then will imply that the character variety has no pure part in the middle degree, and it turns out that the intersection form can only be non-trivial on the pure part because of weight considerations, and so this purity conjecture in for that case, for example, implies that intersection form must be trivial. That's what is now checked with by, uh, by Johan, by looking at the Higgs moduli space complex structure, and then you see that uh, he has a completely different attack, and, but he can actually prove it. So it's a big advantage of now looking at the Higgs moduli space. Okay, so, so this is the package of the conjectures we are going to try to uh, con consider for another set of spaces, which will be somehow toric analogs of these, um, of these varieties. So before giving you the, the definition of these varieties, let me start with something which have been around for 15 years now, it's introduced by Bielowski and Denser, the toric hyperkiller varieties. And these are hyperkiller analogs of toric varieties, which you can think of as toric killer varieties. Um, and then in, uh, soon after with Ben Stolfels, we had an algebraic geometry approach, and that's the one I'm going to present here to construct these, um, these hyperkiller, toric hyperkiller varieties. So it comes from the data of a D times N uh, surjective integer matrix. Um, and that gives rise to a surjective map from the lattice Zn to Zd. Then you pick a, a generator set in the kernel of A. It's called uh, the Gale dual matrix B. And that way you get a short exact sequence of uh, abelian groups. Then you can change this to many other sequences. For example, you can take home to, to C star, which will abbreviate to the group T. And then you get uh, some dual sequence going backwards. Now the torus, the d-dimensional torus is a subtorus of T to the N, again, very explicitly embedded by the matrix, the transpose matrix of A. 
And now the, the starting point of the construction is to start with the subtorus given by AT inside TN and observe that TN is a natural Hamiltonian action on T star CN with respect to its natural symplectic form. And then you can look at the subtorus, how it acts, and then it turns out that it's also Hamiltonian and the moment map of this action, of the TD action on T star CN, is going to be a map from T star of CN to the dual of the, um, the Lie algebra of the group, which is we can identify with CD. And the map is very explicit. So this map is just the usual moment map for uh, the action. So the action, of course, on C, it acts with weight one, and on the cotangent direction, it acts with weight minus one, so that it preserves the symplectic form. And then the moment map in each coordinate is just x times y. And then you follow it up with the matrix A, and then you get a map from here to there, and that's your map. It's very simple quadratic map. And then to construct the quotient, we are going to construct a symplectic algebraic symplectic quotient of, the, of this space by this section. You will pick xi, it's going to be an element here. We will pick it always to be generic in a certain sense. And then we take the pre-image, the level set of the moment map at xi, and uh, it's one, one property of the moment map, it's equivariant with respect to the action of the torus. So I can look at the action of the torus on the level set, and then I take the quotient, an affine algebraic, an affine GIT quotient, and then I get an affine variety, and then this is what we call a toric hyperkiller variety. So that's the variety. Uh, we studied and Bielewski and Dancer studied. They were interested in a hyperkiller metric, so you can also do a hyperkiller construction underlying this complex algebraic geometric one. But we were interested in a more algebraic approach. So the dimension of this is two times n minus d, and complex dimension. It's even dimension, of course, because it's symplectic or hyperkiller. And then what you see, the reason it's called toric, because there is a residual action of the quotient torus, this t to the n minus d. It still acts on the, on the level set and commutes with the action of td. So it still acts on the, on the toric hyperkiller variety. And this is the largest dimensional torus which can act in a symplectic way. And um, that's why we call it a toric hyperkiller variety. And then you have a map down to a half a dimensional uh, space, this T, uh, the, the Lie algebra of this torus, the dual of the Lie algebra. And uh, now this map, it, as I said, this is an affine variety, so the fibers will be generically complex, um, the affine tori, so, so T to the N minus D will be isomorphic, all the fibers. And uh, when you try to understand the cohomology or the topology of this, one thing you can do is try to understand the, the discriminantal locus of this map. And it turns out to be a hyperplane arrangement, a complex hyperplane arrangement, which is modeled on this vector configuration given by this matrix uh, BT. So you have these N minus D dimensional vectors, N of them, um, and then uh, somehow they live in the dual space of this, they will give you um, hyperplanes, but the hyperplane arrangement is affine in general, so it's only the direction of the hyperplanes these vectors are giving. And then, it's maybe not that surprising now, is that the topology, the cohomology ring, for example, can be understood completely from the combinatorics of this uh, affine hyperplane arrangement. And one fact we will need later, and that's the simplest of these observations, the total cohomology, the dimension of the total cohomology, the, or in this case only even cohomology exists, so it's the Euler characteristic of this, is a combinatorial quantity you can read off from the hyperplane arrangement. This is the number of vertices of the hyperplane arrangement, which you can read off from the matroid, from this vector configuration, the number of an n minus d tuples, which are bases for, for, for q n minus d. So some combinatorial data is the vertices of the hyperplane arrangement. Okay, so an example, and basically this is always the best studied example, when the uh, matrix A comes from a quiver. So we have a quiver. If you know about quiver varieties, this is going to be a quiver variety with dimension vector one everywhere. And then, but to, to come into our picture, we need to have a surjective matrix like that. So the quiver gives us a matrix, an n times d matrix, 
with a formula, something like this, for each edge you send to this, uh, this formula for the, for the vertices. Anyway, this will give you a surjective matrix, and this way, to any quiver, you can also follow the same construction, and you get a variety. We will abbreviate to this Q gamma, is the toric quiver variety, basically going back to Nakajima. Again, it's the quiver variety where all the dimension vectors are one. Okay, and this variety is, was the starting point back then, 10 years ago almost, with uh, Nick. We wanted to build the whole set of spaces around the non-abelian Hodge theory, and the observation was that this variety is very similar. In fact, it's the same way constructed as the, as the M star Durham spaces, those star-shaped quiver varieties, except that the quiver is different and the dimension vector is different. But the hope was back then that we might be able to have all the spaces around them. So, and this turns out to be true. Now we have um, these spaces. But today I'm going to concentrate on the analog of the character variety in the toric case. So the toric character variety is basically because we had the conjecture on their cohomology. Uh, so that's what I am going to, to discuss. So first let's talk about the toric analog, the multiplicative analog of these, uh, of these, these toric quiver varieties. It, it is basically that idea we took, so it must have been nine years ago or, or less, we took the idea from the paper of Crowley, Bobby, and Shaw, okay, but this appeared in 2004, so it could still be 10 years ago. Uh, in that paper, they are constructing um, multiplicative analogs of the quiver varieties. They are interested in uh, pre-projective algebras, but they look at the representation variety of those multiplicative pre-projective algebras, so they look at all spaces. Um, Okay, so in the case when the dimension vector is one, they look at every dimension vector, but we are only interested in this talk in the case when it's a dimension vector, dimension vectors are one. Then the only thing what Philip called uh, this Vandenberg space is what we call Z, is the building block of the construction. So if you remember, so you would have a map from one, one dimension vector space that way and one back. And the condition is that if you come around and, okay, you can, I play around with the constants now, for simplicity we subtract one, and this boy, we want this to be non-zero, to be invertible. So in practice it's a very simple surface, from C2 we leave out this, uh, this uh, quadric um, x, y minus one equals zero. We will look at actually some geometric pictures of this z later. So this one has now a modified symplectic form, it's a nice uh, form with uh, some logarithmic uh, term edit here. And uh, it has the usual T action in the sense that it will act with weight 1 on X and weight minus 1 on Y. It will leave invariant this symplectic form. And more than that, its action is going to be quasi-Hamiltonian this time, in the sense that there is going to be a group-valued moment map uh, from Z to T, which is the C star, and namely this map, x, y minus one, which was supposed to be non-zero, so indeed it will end up in, the, in C star. And again, this map satisfies the properties of a quasi-Hamiltonian map. So we will just take the quotient construction by using quasi-Hamiltonian quotients in the place of usual Hamiltonian quotients and replacing C2 with this z. Okay, the setup is the same, the way how we find the uh, the subtorus of uh, Tn is given by the same matrix A as before. And so now we let T to the N act on Z to the N with the, this action. And then we can uh, show that this map now with respect to this subtorus is also quasi-Hamiltonian. And then you can write down the moment map again very easily by combining uh, N copies of this group-valued moment map with the matrix A. So it's again very explicit. Um, and, uh, and then it gives you a map. And now, again, you take a generic element from the torus, zeta, now we will call it zeta, and you look at the quotient of the level set of the group-valued moment map by the group T to the D. Again, it was set up everything so that this uh, is going to be a quivariant with respect to the torus section uh, here, and so it will act on the level sets, and you can take the affine GIT quotient. You get another affine variety which we want to think of as the multiplicative analog of the toric hyperkiller variety. 
Okay, the dimension is the same as before. What's going to be used is the symplectic form. For example, in the curious hard left shed theorem, we need to have this uh, holomorphic symplectic form, but that is given us by general constructions of Alexei, Malkin, and Mein Rankin. For all these group valued uh, quotients, you get a natural holomorphic symplectic form on the quotient. Okay, again, just to go back to the original construction, so Crowley, Bowie, and Shaw didn't look at the general uh, case, only the case when the matrix A comes from a quiver, and in that case, these varieties were indeed constructed by Crowley, Bowie, and Shaw. Okay, so we have these varieties, and then you can start to study their cohomology. And then you see that its cohomology seem to behave exactly the same way as, uh, as the usual character varieties. And then that motivated us to try to dream around these old uh, structures of the, on the cohomology relating to various aspects of non-Abelian Hodge theory. But it turned out, and so back then, uh, 2008, in my talks, then I would go on, construct you the analog, the Deram analog, the Dolbo analog, would formulate the conjectures as I did in the general case, and then I say some few uh, checks which, which, which work. But today I can prove the theorem, but the, one of the crucial difficulty was back then that we didn't really have a non-Abelian Hodge theorem. Um, we just had the spaces, they looked very similar topologically, they look like they should be, but we didn't have a natural map between them. And even today it's hard. You will see that some of the Dolbo space is a bit trickier than usual. It's going to be an abelian fibration, but not uh, on a affine space, but only over a multi-disc. So therefore, it was difficult to relate the two, but now we can do it in another way. So what we managed to do, we managed to find the Hitchin map in the Higgs moduli space complex structure. We can now define the Hitchin map in the character variety complex structure. It's not going to be algebraic map anymore. It's not going to be a complex Lagrangian fibration because we are in the character variety complex structure, but we will have a special Lagrangian fibration. And in fact, I saw this in a talk of uh, Oru, precisely our Z. He considered this for completely different reasons. He was interested in mirror symmetry on non-projective varieties, and this was his first non-trivial, non-toric. For him, it's non-toric, although for us, it's the basic toric building block. Example, this Z, in the way he was thinking about mirror symmetry, is to introduce a special Lagrangian fibration precisely on our Z. And then it's just two simple maps. You map Z to R2. Um, okay, he would only take, not the logarithm, I take the logarithm because then I can really think of this as an additive R2. The group structure will be important here, but we take the logarithm anyway. It's not going to be zero, so it's okay. So you have these two functions on Z, and then what Oru has observed and proved is that this is a proper special Lagrangian fibration. So, in order to think about its fibers, let me list you the fibers. Uh, so, the fibers will be of two types. They will be a torus, usually a two compact two torus, uh, which we denote TR, I denote the U1 group. So, it's a isom diffeomorphic with a compact two torus. If we are outside of the origin of R2, when you are at the origin, it is a pinch torus, a torus where you pinch one circle. Um, so it's a familiar fibration if you had seen the Tate curve, and then at the end we will relate it to the Tate curve, um, and that's the idea somehow, that the Tate curve should be the Hitchin map in the historic story, but we can hard, it's hard to relate it to Z. Instead, we look at this special Lagrangian fibration and it will look like the Tate curve, it will look like the toric Hitchin map. So I can, I think, just steal Oru's wonderful picture of this vibration from his paper, slightly modified. So to understand this, this topology, and this is crucial for this talk, so I, I would like to explain this a little bit more. So you take the map from C2 to, to C, this X times Y. Just first you think about the fibers, you have the general, generic fiber is a conic, when X times Y doesn't equal zero, and when it equals zero, you get uh, these two lines. So that's the general type form of this vibration. 
And then in C2, in that Z thing, we remove the fiber over 1, x times y equals 1. So you should imagine Z is everything here in C2 except the fiber over 1. Then what is our map? So the first map, you first map to down to this plane with x times y. You compute the distance from 1 and take the logarithm of that. So when you are thinking about the fiber of this map, if you fix this, uh, this quantity to be r, then this is going to be a circle. Uh, the possible endpoints in that map is going to be a circle with radius e to the r. And so if you are fixed r, then the image is going to be over this circle. And in the fiber, you have to take the, the lambda, the fixed lambda here. And lambda turns out to be somehow the, the distance or the, from the, 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 the shortest circle in this conic. So you have always this sh middle circle. And then you have to compute the distance. And then you see another circle there. So over every point here, you have another circle. So you will have a circle of vibration over the circle. This is going to be your two torals. The only time it degenerates if the if the radius of the circle is one, when you are when this quantity is uh, the logarithm of one is zero, um, and then it's only a problem when you are here over this fiber and then lambda is zero. Then you don't get a circle; you just get a point. So over this fiber, when um, when r is zero, then you get um, everywhere a circle over the circle except over zero where you get a point. So that's the pinch torus. Anyway, so it's a very nice picture. You can really visualize this vibration. And this turns out to be or proves is a special Lagrangian vibration. And then he goes on and does mirror symmetry with respect to this vibration. But we just take it as somehow the right analog of the, the way how we would look at the Hitchin map inside the character variety. And for many purposes, this, this picture will be enough to, to what we want. So then, then the observation is that this map, yes? There is no, well, maybe the Jordan quiver. The, OK, it's the Jordan quiver, but it's the building block Z. You attach it to an edge. That's the Jordan quiver is the best thinking, because we will see later that this thing con con corresponds to an elliptic um, um, a nodal P1, and it's a compactified Jacobian, which is this pinch torus, which will be the zero fiber of this Hitchin map. So it's, a, it's the Jordan quiver. What is the? Oh, a loop on a vertex, a single loop on a vertex. Um, OK, then we notice that, that, that this torus section, the U1 action, uh, leaves this map invariant. So the U1 acts along the fibers of this, and that's enough to to lift this construction to or quotients, and then we are going to get um, on or toric uh, character varieties a map down to this R2 to the n minus d, which is going to be again a proper special Lagrangian vibration. Now the generic fiber is going to be a compact torus of dimension, I guess, I don't know, 2 n minus d. And then it's going to get more singular as usual with the Hitchin vibration. So this is what we think of the Tori Kitchen map in the Betty complex structure. <coughs> OK, so then uh, now we can start to think about the usually if you had studied the Hitchin vibration, then the first thing you start to think about is the, uh, the degener degener degeneracy locus of the map. And then it turns out in this Tori simple combinatorial case, it's going to be the same hyperplane arrangement complexified um, to f live inside this space R2 and minus D over these linear spaces. In general, we only know their, their direction, and there will be some affine hyperplane arrangement down there, modeled on a vector configuration, uh, the same vector configuration, the same hyperplane arrangement as before. But now the map is proper, and then we can try to think about this as if it was the Hitchin map. Right, so along the hyperplanes, uh, if it's just a single hyperplane, the singularity, then you have a very simple fiber, and you get more and more complicated fibers as, as you are on more and more hyperplanes. But generically, it's a torus. This torus starts to degenerate. But in a way, in this case, we will be able to understand everything completely because it's a toric, it's a toric scenario. Real 
right? It's a complex uh, hyperplane arrangement. So you identify R2 with C. It's the combinatorics is the same, but you always have to move things so that you are in the right space. Okay, so then now what we can do is that we can find the analog of the nilpotent cone. In order to get the nilpotent cone, you recall that in the usual Hitchin case, we had a nilpotent cone. was interesting if you had a C-star action, a retracting C-star action on the base, and so you would have a, a special point in the zero somehow which is containing the, all the directions of the discriminant locus. So in our case, this is the analog assumption is that the hyperplane should go through the same point. It's a linear hyperplane arrangement. It can happen if zeta is chosen always to be in the compact torus inside there. Generically, then you can arrange things so that the hyperplane arrangement is going to have only one common intersection. And um, in that case, it's going to be a linear hyperplane arrangement. And you can expect that the fiber over this one is going to be an interesting fiber of the historic uh, vibration. We call this the toroidal core over zero in this case. And this turns out to be a very nice variety itself as a, okay, so this is a real <coughs> even dimensional sub variety. There is a natural symplectic structure on it. And with that symplectic structure, it's actually a toric symplectic manifold. But we will somehow think of this as the corresponding compact toric variety because the message is that in the Higgs moduli space complex structure, this should be an actual toric variety. But this is not normal. So it's like a bunch of toric varieties glued together along as toric uh, sub varieties. So the way to picture this, you have your hyperplane arrangement, but now you put it on a torus instead of uh, like the usual space, usual plane. And uh, on the torus, you have this generic hyperplane arrangement with sub-tori, sub sub-hyper-tori. And you have the regions, and over every region you have this polytope, you have their uh, a toric variety, and you glue these toric varieties together along those, those walls as, as expected. So it's a non-normal compact toric variety. Surprisingly non-trivial topology, though. So it's, uh, it's, it sounds like toric variety, but it's, um, it's somehow trickier. So in fact, these constructions go back earlier by in a different setup. If gamma is a quiver and the matrix comes from the, the quiver, then <coughs> the, this core you attach to the hyperplane arrangement in this quiver setup, it turns out to be um, Okay, this is just a differentiable manifold. It's differentiable, diffeomorphic to the compactified Jacobian of a reducible curve, reducible rational nodal curve, where the graph of the intersection is precisely your, gra your graph gamma. Sorry? This is the fiber. So the or vibration is proper. The fibers are compact. So my fiber is precisely the compact defy Jacobian of this re re nodal rational curve. It depends on a zeta, and this can be compared to the or zeta, the, the stability condition in the compactified Jacobian. And amazingly, this goes back very early to Oda Shashadri. And in their paper, they already have one of our favorite examples as well. In the case when the curve is the dollar sign curve, it's just the Kronecker quiver, two vertices, one for each of the curve with three edges between them. That's the quiver. The three edges correspond to the intersection, the three intersection point. And the corresponding compactified Jacobian, for us the corresponding toroidal core, is a toric surface, a non-normal non toric variety. And here you see the two torus with the uh, toroidal hyperplane arrangement. So you have two P1s glued to this uh, this double blown up P1 times P1, corresponding to this hexagon, and you glue them along these P1s. Uh, so these are P2s, sorry. So two P2s, and then this P1 times P1 blown up at two points, and then you glue them along P1s, but you then also glue these sides to this side, this side to this side, and this side to this side. So you have a, um, a, a somehow a, a toric variety over a torus. Okay, so that was, as I say, already in this early paper. And then what we can prove, which is uh, 
which really for us relates the two words, the Dobo word in the historic case, which is basically the compactified Jacobian of these uh, the reducible uh, nodal curves. With the character variety, what we can prove, and this is really what started our activity again with the same, finally we managed to prove the homotopy equivalence. So inside the character variety, we see this a compact subvariety sitting, and we managed to do a sort of Morse theory. What we are lacking, why it's hard to prove, we don't have the C star action, we don't really have the Higgs moduli space complex structure, not in this picture, and so you want to retract everything to the zero fiber, but you can do it by, by doing Morse theory with basically the, the Hitchin, that you take the, the norm square of the Hitchin map, very similar to what you do with the Hitchin vibration, uh, and then you analyze the more theoretical properties of this map, and then you can deduce indeed that everything will actually retract, will be homotopy equivalent to the to this central fiber. And this is great because this is, was the first time where we could relate the two words, the character variety, with the compactified Jacobian, which somehow should be the nilpotent cone in the Higgs moduli space uh, complex structure. And then after this, when uh, we, we thought about a lot about proving this, then the structures became more cleaner, and then suddenly we had a, as a proof of both the tori koch and, but more interestingly, the curious hard left theorem, because I haven't seen really an approach how you would prove curious hard left in general, and here is a very nice approach which we discovered by looking at the combinatorics of these. So the statement now, which is a theorem, that the cohomology of these toric character varieties is hot state and satisfies curious hard left sheds. So I'm going to sketch you the proof. So how is the theory to gamma Yeah, you have the, the quiver. Every vertex, you have a P1, and the, the edge corresponds to a nodal intersection between the two P1s. So the Jordan curve is a nodal P1. No, no direction, no. Yes, but you know how this is. When you do the constructions, you can introduce any orientation that will go into the construction, but yeah. Okay, so the, so the idea of the proof is that what we managed to do, we managed to cover the whole uh, character variety with smaller open subsets. And we could prove the curious hard left sets and the hot state on those open subsets and their overlaps. And basically, by after this, it's easy to prove by Meyer Viatorius to deduce that if these smaller things satisfy these two properties, then so will be their union. And then it's very nice. It turns out that it, this variety has something like a cluster variety structure. So if you follow these, uh, these works of um, Fogoncharov, and, um, and all this business, then this actually was probably we were motivated by this, but this, of course, you never know what was the, the thinking eventually. But so what we first find is a torus inside or Z. That's what we call the cl tori cluster torus. You just remove one more line, x equals zero. You can nicely prove that this is a torus. If you want to do real cluster business, you also can remove the y line, and you have two uh, cluster tori. You can look at the transition maps, and you see all that stuff they are talking about. But for us, for now, we just fix one of these uh, Tori cluster toros. And now in, we will push uh, through this uh, open subvariety in Z into the whole construction by the quotient. So to any subset of the, of, of the letters 1 to N, we, have, uh, cons we can construct an open subvariety inside or toric character variety. So we take the same quotient construction, but at some of the coordinates, we restrict ourselves to be in the torus. So if, if S is a subset, then we just, if S was everything, then this would be the usual, the whole thing. But if S is smaller, then we restrict sometimes ourselves to the case when the, the coordinate there is non zero. And you take the quotient, and then we get an open subvariety in the toric uh, character variety. Okay, that's already nice enough. Then you can think about how they cover. But it turns out that in, if S is small, so for example, when S is empty, it is an actual torus. It's a, it's a 
cluster torus inside this character variety, and then you can change x to zero and y to zero, and you can do, really do this cluster business. But for us, just want to have a covering, and we observe that it's not just the empty set when it is easy to identify. When this subset is linearly independent, then you can show that this character variety is very simple. It's just z, x, s number of copies of of z times the torus. It's a very simple variety, which will be an open sub-variety here. And then you can understand its topology completely. In fact, it's very easy to see that z satisfies hard left sheds, curious hard left sheds and, and hot state. So that will imply that these open sub-varieties will also satisfy this. But the combinatorics is very nice because you can control what happens at the intersections. And they will intersect very nicely. The intersection will be one of another example of this. And you see that as on the intersections, then you will have hard, uh, um, Hochstedt and curious hard left sheds. And then the final thing you have to show is that, in fact, you can cover the whole variety, not with cluster tori, but with these slightly <coughs> enlarged open sub varieties where you allow. Uh, allow some of the coordinates to be not in the torus, but those coordinates you allow has to somehow come from linearly independent subsets in your hyperplane arrangement. Okay, and if you believe all this now, you should be able to think about how you can build up the cohomology of the whole thing, one after the other. So you start with an open sub variety, you take another on the intersection, and on each of them you have these theorems, the Hodge Tate and the Curious Hardleft Sheds. You write down the Meyer Viatoris long exact sequence, you compare things, and then you will get it on the union. And you do it again with adding one more. And that way, we will, we will be able to prove the theorem, which was very satisfactory because it gives the, for me, the first somehow conceptual way to prove curious hard left sheds on a variety by covering it with open sub varieties, which are much simpler, and so are their overlaps. Okay, and then let me finish with, oh no, it's not finished, unfortunately, that's good. Because we still have one more result, the toric purity. Okay, so this theorem is interesting because it shows that, uh, that the cohomology of this uh, toric character varieties upgrade the cohomology of the, uh, of the toric hyperkiller varieties we started back then 15 years ago. So we understand this completely, this cohomology. And now we can prove that the pure part of the character varieties is exactly isomorphic with this. So somehow this is a further deformation of the cohomology of these toric uh, quiver varieties or hy toric hyperkiller varieties. So the proof is now we need one more ingredient. We need the analog of the Riemann-Hilbert map. And in our work, we actually have the analog of the Deram space, but I don't spend time on constructing that. Um, Instead, of what I prove is what is going to be enough is a map, and which will be the analog of the Riemann-Hilbert map from, from C2 to Z first, and then we will upgrade it through the quotient construction from a map from the toric hyperkiller variety to the character variety, which will be somehow the analog of the map of the m star Deram space mapping into the character variety. But it will not be an embedding. It will be only finite to one map. Is M star the ROM? Is if you, if I had constructed for you our M star the ROM space, then yes, it would be an open subset in there. But I'm not going to construct for you. Yes, but again, I haven't constructed for you the the ROM analog of the toric space. We do that, and then it's going to be an open subset. But it will have an infinite topological type, so it's not entirely obvious the M-star theorem space. Okay, the one issue which I should have emphasized, what, what is the difference, is that Z has, a, no, has fundamental group Z, so it's not simply connected. This is really unlike any of the Hitchin systems we had looked at, which they are always simply connected. And this, this fundamental group is, I think, uh, the reason why things are harder in this story in a way. It's a simpler too, because we can prove theorems. So I can just cook up by hand the map from C2 to, to Z, which will intertwine the, the, the moment maps in a nice way. So it's going to be a finite to one local uh, isomorphism uh, from C2 to, to Z. OK, you just I give it by coordinates like that. You can check that this is an 
an, an analytical map, finite to one, local isomorphism, and what's the way it's set up so that this square commutes. So if I take the moment map here, the usual additive moment map, I take exponential here to go to the multiplicative world, I have my group valued moment map here, and this map is set up so that this commutes. And then if you can do this, and here it is, you can do it, then you can push it through the quotient construction, and then you will get a map from the toric quiver hyperkiller variety to the character variety. And then because this goes through the quotient construction, you will get natural line bundles on both of them coming from the um, characters of the torus you are dividing by, it's the same torus, and then this will also pull back, the, the, those um, line bundles will pull back to the line bundles here. And that shows, because we know that the cohomology of this is generated by the churn classes of those line bundles, that shows that, um, and then those cohomologies here also have to be pure, because these are churn classes of line bundles, uh, that shows that this map is, has to be surjective. So it was actually this one we knew already uh, seven years ago, but now we can also prove that it had they, these two vector spaces have the same dimension. And that's partly combinatorics, but partly the curious hard left theorem. Because by curious hard left theorem, the, the curious hard left dual of the pure part is always the middle cohomology of the variety. And then I already mentioned that uh, no, the middle cohomology of the variety <laughs> So this variety now retracts to the toroidal core. The toroidal core is a toric variety over this toroidal hyperplane arrangement. Its top cohomology is going to be the number of regions in the toroidal hyperplane arrangement. So it's now this half-dimensional variety. It's going to be its top cohomology of the core, toroidal core. So the, the dimension of this is the number of top dimension regions in the toroidal hyperplane arrangement. Now you do the ref, uh, simple Morse theory, and it's very nice on a toroidal hyperplane arrangement, there are as many uh, top dimensional regions as vertices, because you take a generic direction and you send every region to the highest vertex, highest vertex in that direction, and that's a one-to-one -one map between the two. So it's actually the same as the vertices of the toroidal hyperplane arrangement, which is the same as the vertices of the hyperplane arrangement, which is the same as the total dimension of the toric uh, hyperkiller variety. So you have a surjective map of varieties of the same dimension, so you can deduce that this is an isomorphism. Okay, so these were the theorems we can prove. But then when we were pushing it, uh, then it came very close to prove the P equals W conjecture about them. So let me discuss this on the last slide, um, because we don't have a theorem, it's, it's, it's just comments on toric P equals W. Okay, so let's recall now this special Lagrangian vibration. We would like to do the same thing, so I want to define a perverse filtration on the cohomology of this special Lagrangian vibration. It's not really possible, you need the algebraic structure. But the whole Z we cannot uh, algebraify, but a piece of it, basically we take a unit disk around origin, take the preimage of that, and that part of the special Lagrangian vibration you can prove is diffeomorphic with the Tate curve, which is a um, family of elliptic curves with a single single fiber, the nodal P1 over the unit disk. But now this has a complex structure at least, or a local algebraic structure. And that way, you can push this diffeomorphism to the construction, and you see that the neighborhood of the core, the toroidal core, is going to be diffeomorphic to a local abelian vibration, which you obtain from the Tate curve and its powers, um, with generic fibers, abelian varieties, and then you have the usual, now, complex picture of, a, of an abelian vibration with central singular fiber, which is the uh, toroidal core, this toric variety. Okay, and this way now you have a complex structure on the vibration, and it will induce a perverse filtration on the cohomology of, the, of this uh, singular variety, of this uh, toroidal core. And so the conjecture, which I just checked for the case of this, because I remember that in the very beginning of our discussions with De Cataldo and Migliorini, we were back then working with Proudfoot on these constructions. I was always trying to discuss that too, 
that case of the P equals W conjecture for the historic uh, character varieties, and we discussed it, they looked easy, and we passed on to the more complicated, much more complicated situation of the usual Hitchin map for GL2. And so we never concluded that those discussions, so, but uh, you can say we already had a conjecture back then, that in the case when the hyperplanes of the, the discriminant locus of the, um, this uh, toric Hitchin map goes through a point, which is this condition, then we have the, the P equals W conjecture in the sense that the weight filtration on the character already matches the perverse filtration okay on the, on the cohomology of this singular fiber, uh, which comes uh, from this local uh, abelian fi fibration around this. Anyway, so this was already a conjecture back then. And now we almost see this. I mean, it's, we are close to prove something like this, um, but for that, you have to somehow separate this, this discriminant locus. So here, the difficulty is that still the central fiber is very complicated. But if you push the hyperplanes away, and I can do that by moving zeta here out of this compact torus, then you have a hyperplane arrangement, and you can arrange it that the hyperplane arrangement is generic, and then all fibers are very simple. Uh, you can, these are actually going to be the matching fibers to the open subsets in the other covering. And so the only thing now we would need to understand what's the analog of the core, which part of this hyperplane arrangement um, can be seen as homotopically equivalent to the whole space. And it turns out that it, it must be that you take the bounded part of the hyperplane arrangement, the bounded regions, and then you take the preimage of that. Now it's a generic hyperplane arrangement. You take the preimage of that. That should be the analog of the core in here. And if so, this is really a homotopy equivalence. Or proof with the Morse theory is more tricky here. So it's not uh, straightforward to extend that. But if we had this, then it looks like that uh, over the bounded complex of the hyperplane arrangement, we can do the same combinatorics we did for, with the meyer viatori sequence for the character variety. <coughs> so one can see the analog of those open subsets. With, they will correspond in this new vibration to the fibers of the Hitchin map. So the picture, again, is this. So for every fiber of the Hitchin map on the character variety side, I have an open subvariety, which uh, will retract to this fiber of the Hitchin map. So they will be homotopically equivalent. And then the way how you glue them together, the, you glue them the, the open subvarieties, and then in the Hitchin vibration, you extend more and more of the Hitchin vibration. You do it the same meyer viatori sequence. So if you can prove P equals W on the simple fibers locally, the hope is that you can extend it to a proof, proof globally. So then finally, let me say that even this raises the possibility to attack the P equals W conjecture on general, the usual GLN character varieties. And this goes back to ideas of physicists. So the physicists are actually saying this, and then also Konservich, Soy, Bellman, and mathematicians picking up these ideas, that to a um, fiber of the Hitchin map, that is a spectral curve, OK, they talk about, physicists talk about the smooth ones. So you take a smooth spectral curve, there should be a cluster torus inside the character variety corresponding to this. And you should think of this cluster torus as the GL1 character variety of the smooth spectral curve. So the idea is to take a GL1 connection on the spectral curve, push it forward, and then you manipulate the, at the branch points the so obtained uh, connection. And, uh, and using those pin networks, whatever they draw on the Riemann surface, you can modify uh, the, the singularities of the push-forward connection. And this would be a Boville ramanan uh, narasimhan ramanan construction, but for the character variety. For us to be able, I don't think it's going to cover, so you can now take a lot of cluster tori inside the character variety corresponding to the, the smooth fibers of the Ichin map. It's not going to cover the whole thing. You will have to extend it, but my hope is that you can cover it with uh, character varieties corresponding to singular curves. So in this talk, we saw that if the singular curve only has nodes, these are nodal, then we understand the corresponding character varieties, and then we should be able to put in those character varieties as open sub-varieties. So my question is, if I only take nodal singular spectral curves, the corresponding character varieties we had constructed today, put inside, according to what the physicists are saying, into the character variety, do they cover 
If they do, then the results of this P equals W in this case would yield the P equals W in the global case by this meyer viatoris argument. But I think you probably have to extend it to general integral spectral curves and the corresponding character varieties, which should be some wild character varieties studied by Shende and, and others. Okay, thank you very much. Sorry? Yes, right. The Hitchin map gives you the, the discriminant locus, and the discriminant locus is a hyperplane arrangement. It's that combinatorics of that knows about the. Yeah, I mean, that, that gives me the. Yeah, from that I can recover <coughs> the, the cuber, I think. From the metroid of the. Yeah, I should think about this, but I think it's enough, yeah. Other questions? Yes. Uh, earlier, you, uh, you mentioned uh, all the C Shadri uh, 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 Jacobian, uh, so it's defined for reduce, uh, uh, reducible curves. Why do you insist here about uh, the integral uh, nodal spectral curves? Okay, so first you can talk about nodal spectral curves. Um, and, but what I proved in, the, in this uh, case, that you can somehow replace the whole, so you take a, a reducible curve, right? You look at its compactified Jacobian. We proved that this is homotopically equivalent with the corresponding character value, which we covered with smaller subspaces, and those correspond to compactified Jacobians of nodal curves, which are reducible. So we managed, basically that was one of the message, we managed to reduce everything to the, to the reducible case. And so my hope is that maybe the integral ones therefore will be enough to cover. <coughs> These are constructions which are highly speculative, even physicists don't dare to speculate about putting the character, first of all, we don't have the definition of a GL1 character value of a singular curve. Okay, but then we can imagine there is a character variety we can attach to it. Then you want to put it in the, in the character variety. And the hope is that it's enough to cover the whole character variety to do the character varieties attached to integral curves. That would be the analog of what we discovered in this case, where the, in the nodal case, we managed to cover the character variety with, with the character varieties corresponding to reduci irreducible curves, the simplest ones. And then it would be why it's very nice, this potential, because it's very similar in a way to the feeling of what Engo was doing. Engo was also only considering the integral case, and he found very nice structures there. And this would say that somehow the topology of the Hitchin, of that is the character right, is decided again on the integral part. Thank you. So I think there's no time for more questions. So let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.